Welcome to Talking Point. It is my privilege today to interview one among the most prominent paleoecologists and evolutionary biologists of our time. Dutch-born UC Davis Distinguished Professor Emeritus Herard Verme of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Professor Verme has more than 200 publications, including five published books and as well as papers in such leading journals as Paleobiology Science Journal and others. Most recently, he was elected as a member of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. He holds degrees from Yale and Princeton universities. His research has yielded intriguing insights about humanity, evolution, ecology, biology, and economics. Professor Verme's trademark, if you will, is to ask questions about simple things, and from those questions, glean answers about the big things that concerns us all. His latest book, The Evolution of Power, is due to be published in November 2023 by Princeton University Press. Our interview will focus on how power has played a determining role in the evolution of all life on Earth and the impact that humans have made as the most powerful species ever evolved on our Earth. Stay tuned. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Now, well, today, you're welcome. today, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your upcoming book, The Evolution of Power, uh, A New Understanding of the History of Life, which is, as we said, due to be published in November by Princeton University Press. So I will start by saying, um, I was trained as a linguist, so words mean a lot to me. So the word evolution and power lend themselves to many interpretations and evoke thoughts, feelings, experiences, prejudices, far beyond the definition of the dictionary. So my question to you is, what is your interpretation of evolution and power? And most importantly to me is, why do you link them together? <laughs> right. So to me, evolution is mostly in, in its broadest definition, in its biological definition. It's a three-word definition. It is a, a change with modification. Descent with modification, I really should say. It's descent with modification. I see. So it, it's a description. It's not, it, it implies nothing about mechanism. It doesn't mention natural selection or adaptation, for example. Yes. Now, then I distinguish something called adaptive evolution, which is the uh, descent with modification implying that organisms are well fitted to their environment. Yes. And that too is a description. It still doesn't give you the mechanism. So in the book, I um, argue that a combination of natural selection and agency, by which I mean behavior, response, uh, the organism's modification of its own environment, they both contribute to the adapted state. Yes. So, but where does power come into it? Right. So, first of all, power as a definition, I, I use the definition that a physicist or an engineer would use, which yes. is energy per unit time. Yes. So time plays a large role here. Um, we all know that uh, life is a, a condition where energy has to be acquired and used by a, a coordinated system. 
Well, uh, almost implicitly, that means uh, that time is also involved. So that any process, any living process, has to be measured in, in units of power. It's as simple as that. I see. Yes, that makes it uh, a little easier for me to understand. And um, <clears throat> uh, let me go to another question for you. Um, well, and we, we should, we, I should really connect the two because that's what you asked to start with. Yes, um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, Please go ahead. So, uh, so I argue in the book, and of course, you know, I do it in more than 250 pages or whatever it is. Um, I argue that over time, over the history of life, uh, that power has increased at all scales of biological organization, you know, basically from the cell all the way to the, to the biosphere it, itself. And at the end, I argue that... Um, humans are kind of the an outcome of this process that has occurred over the entire history of life uh, so we're we're not really an anomaly in that sense we're an anomaly in other ways but not in the sense of a trend in history yes and i believe that uh, by anomaly you mean our superior intelligent uh, in, in you know, intelligence um, you know many many people put humans on a on a pedestal above all the rest of life and yes. in some respects that is accurate i would say intelligence is part of it i would argue that sociality is probably more important or perhaps correlated with intelligence Plus, our individuality also really matters, and I discuss all of that in the book. The reason that power has increased uh, is that um, natural selection, adaptation, and agency are universals in the history of life. And there's almost always an advantage to having as much power as is possible. Now, in some cases, such as in a parasite, you're going to have very little power, but they still will try as much power as they can get. Yeah. So there's a relentless tendency for power to be as large as possible. It gives just too many advantages. Professor Verme, is that power a necessity for survival, perhaps? Um, I would say that... that more power gives you a competitive, in the very broad sense, a competitive edge. Now, you can get away with having very little power, as, for example, mosses. You know, we can't think of mosses as having very much power, even in the aggregate. Um, likewise, there are uh, very slow-growing bacteria that individually or per capita don't have very much power. And even in the aggregate, they also don't have very much. However, they are so constrained by the things, by the organisms that influence them, uh, that even, even among these organisms, um, in their extremely constrained mode of life, they will still favor as much power as is feasible for them. Another question for you. <laughs> in the natural world, uh, which includes... Uh, humankind, um, has power evolved hand in hand with natural selection, would you say? I would argue that um, natural selection is one of two major mechanisms by which organisms uh, uh, use power. Mm -hmm. So power is a measure. It's it's a whole series of dimensions that we collectively call power. You know, you measured in watts. Uh, I have one uh, subheading in chapter one called "What is Power," and I spell it W A T T. Um, and um, <laughs> yeah, it's the only pun in the book, I think. Um, 
<laughs> and um, the um, uh, so it is a measure by which we can organize a great many apparently disparate phenomena, such as, for example, an increase in body size, an increase in violence, an increase in locomotor performance. Yes. Uh, and many of and these, are, I treat all of these things. And uh, the achievement of a social organization is a very important step. And of course, we're not the only ones that did that, but we did it in combination with um, a an individuality that, say, insect societies mostly lack. You mentioned that power increases uh, with time, and, uh, of course, that makes us think about today, and uh, we'll touch on, on uh, societies in a moment, but uh, is, is because natural selection is evolving, does power evolve... Uh, as a consequence or vice versa? Am I making myself clear here? <laughs> so what's evolving is the number of choices available to organisms. I see. So again, since power is energy per unit time, well, energy itself is mass times velocity mm -hmm. per, uh, so mass, oh, well, that's mass times velocity is force. And, um, um so we can we can um see what the dimensions are of energy so we have mass we have size we have number we have speed any one of these can be increased or more than one of these can be increased in order to maximize power or if you want to look at it from a victim's point of view what you might want to do is to decrease the power of your enemy. So you can see through the dimensionality of power almost all of the possible directions or pathways by which you can increase your own power or decrease the power of your enemy. That makes it a lot clearer. Uh, thank you. Let's move on to, um, again, your book. In your book... Uh, do you focus on the evolution of power within the context of our contemporary societies? I do. Uh, I devote a, a a large chapter, a long chapter, to the power that humans have accrued, and uh, discuss the the one way in which we really do stand out, and that is that. As a species, we have become a monopoly over everything else. And there's never been a one species monopoly in the history of life until modern humans, modern technological humans uh, evolved. Economists tend to think the, the bad thing about, econ uh, about monopoly is uh, that the, the, the market is distorted and you know, that prices are not fair and so on. I think the much greater danger of a monopoly in any way is uh, that there's no corrective. In other words, if we make a mistake, there's no one, there's no species to es essentially inform us that we've made a mistake. So true. So, so true. Yes. So mono we have really, since about 1980 or thereabouts, we have been using more resources, biological resources, than can be sustained. Um, so this is creating a, a really huge problem, a unique problem in the history of life. And so I, I talk about I talk about some necessarily very difficult solutions <clears throat> to this to this condition. But mostly what I'm saying is this is in some sense a natural outcome of history. And in some case, in, in another sense, it is a unique outcome. Yes. Because it's so, so powerful. Yes. Um, and uh, we are perhaps set to destroy our natural environment uh, uh, and perhaps ourselves. Well, it sure does look that way. And yes. there's nothing to say otherwise, as far as I can tell. And I have to admit uh, that at the end of the book, or near the end of the book, not quite the end, 
uh, I um, uh, indicate that I am you're, I'm supposed to be an optimist, but actually I'm not all that optimistic about that. Well, a uh, very few people are. Uh, one question: I have a feeling that uh, this new book, your latest book, uh, you've been holding in your heart for many, many years. Uh, is that true? Uh, yes and no. Um, I have. I started this entire quest, you know, back. <laughs> I hate to say it, but about 50 years ago. <laughs> and, um, you know, these kinds of thoughts and, and the knowledge that you kind of have to have in order to make sense out of the enormous diversity of life. You know, it, it took me or takes me, I'm still going at it, uh, a lifetime of reading and thinking and observing natural history to come up with this. The book itself I wrote very, very fast, surprisingly. So it's the fastest I've ever written a book. It's not, the formula had been in my head for a long time. And I wrote a paper about now four years ago in which I outlined what eventually turned into a book, although I hadn't really thought about writing a book at that point. But yeah, it, it takes a long time for these things to mature. No doubt about it. <laughs> I, I, I agree. And uh, again, I'm so looking forward to reading the book. Um, another question for you. Um, do you believe that uh, social democracy as a, uh, uh, as a form of um, human experience may preserve the beauty of our natural world for our grandchildren? I think it's the only hope. Um, I mean, insofar as a social democracy enables, in its in its ideal form at least, yes. uh, enables us as a species to think about alternatives, to weigh alternatives, and to try alternatives, um, instead of having a dictator, a single authority dictate, you have a monopoly within a monopoly. So, um, yeah, I think social democracy is the only hope that humans have to do this right. And the only way in which that'll work, and not necessarily perfectly, to say the least, yes. is if we improve the appalling inequalities that still exist and That's perhaps so are getting worse so in society. True. So one of the people uh, that I cite as an economist is Thomas Piketty, uh, who has written massive tomes about inequality and so forth. And I'm pretty much on his uh, in his court on, on this uh, on this problem. Uh, many um prominent finger, uh, thinkers have uh, come to that uh, conclusion, I think. And um, what I like about uh, a social democracy is I think the respect that one has for every species, you know, or at least we are trying. But the demons are always within us. Um, one other question, and uh, this is uh, a, bit, a bit different. Um, is it is historically true that some natural or human events have transformed the course of history? This is a topic I also address myself to uh, yes. in the book. And what you're in effect asking is what is the role of chance events? Yes. Uh, or what extent is, is the whole world predictable? And I, I deal with this. So there's a... a a popular line of um, thought in philosophy as well as in biology and paleontology that contingency, that is to say the dependence on previous events uh, and unpredictable events rules history. So history can be considered as one damn thing after another, if you like. Well, at some level, this is true. At the level of, well, who does what, when, and where? That's unpredictable. But I would argue that an increase in power is the one predictable trend in the history of life. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is, in other words, independent of particular events. It's independent of particular clades or species or, in, in our case, individuals or nations or what have you, um, all of which are contingent to a significant degree. So at some level, there emerges a general trend powered by natural selection and agency, which is an increase in power over time. I promised 20 minutes, and I think <laughs> okay. uh, I'm afraid we will wrap it up. Um, but I do do I would like to give you a chance to add something to our wonderful interview. All of these ideas, you know, are what you might call really highly uh, synthetic in the sense that they're not entirely theoretical. They really do depend on the work of literally tens of thousands of people who carefully observe and who carefully think as they're observing nature and human nature. Mm -hmm. And then to try to put it all together in a coherent, theoretically informed framework. I think that's that has been my um, hope and, and what I try to do in the book. But I really emphasize how important empirical work is to this project. Um, I happen to love natural history. I, I love nature. I love reading. I love learning about things. Do it every single day. No exception. And so it is it, it's really if you will powered by an unending curiosity about the world and to me that that is so enormously satisfying absolutely and i share that feeling and i think that is uh, knowledge and curiosity saves us from uh, some of the distresses and suffering of the world could save us it could. <laughs> no guarantees. No, but we try every day. <laughs> um, some of us do. Uh, yeah. Some of us, yes. As long as we stay away from uh, television and uh, soap operas and... Uh, uh, some well, other... mostly um, as, as long as we're... As long as we keep our faculties about us you know, weighing evidence. Evidence is the key to all of science, of course, and yes. history and so on. We yes. can't ignore evidence, even evidence that we find unpalatable. Yes. We can't ignore it. And we should embrace it. If we don't, then we won't know which problems we have, and we certainly will, won't be able to solve them. So I have a, a great, great deal of respect for evidence and the mechanisms by which we verify things. Well, you're includes... a true scientist. You're a true scientist. Yeah. Well, uh, that's yeah. that's the idea. I, I really believe in things like peer review. Yes. I really believe in testing ideas, but also in proposing ideas. Thank you so much. And I hope we'll have an opportunity to meet at, at some I hope so too. UC Davis event, you know. <laughs> Uh, right. Yes, well, I hope so, too. And I, I appreciate your questions. Uh, they were very good questions. Oh, and that's so... so kind of you. <laughs> I try. I try my best. And I will continue yep. to follow you and be okay. so impressed with what you do. So keep on doing it. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, please stay in touch. Absolutely. And again, thank you so much, Professor Verme. Right. Well, you're most welcome. Yes, and congratulations on your daughter and your grandchildren. I heard oh, thank you. your daughter speaking at the uh, whatever it, it was. Yes, yes the yes. lecture. The, uh, that was a big surprise to me, by the way. <laughs> well, of course. She wanted to surprise And my brother you. as well. Yeah. And she's very beautiful, too. So I really... Yes, oh, yeah. Well, she's, uh, <laughs> she's quite something. I think she'll give you a hard time once in a while, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, danke well. 
Ja, hoor. Klaar gedaan. That's the only word in Dutch. I have two, I know two <laughs> words in Dutch. One is dankjewel oh. and one is goed zo. <laughs> goed zo, yes, I say that all the time. Goed zo, ja. Yeah. Anyway, um, graag gedaan. Oh dear, Which means, I, can't, I can't understand that, but uh, I will. Means, uh, uh, gladly done. <laughs> Well, you have to be born into it. So, thank you very much, Professor Verme. Right ho. A lovely evening and uh, onwards. <laughs> right ho. And again, stay in touch. I will. I definitely will. Thank you. Bye bye now. Right. Bye bye. <laughs>